Um, our next speaker is going to be Dr. Timothy Bussey. Um, they are the Associate Director for the Office of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion at Kenyon College, um, and they will be talking a little bit about um, the legacies of ACT UP in both pop culture and healthcare. Hey, everybody. Sorry about that. My Zoom was doing something weird for a minute. Um, so thank you all so much for having me. Um, and I am going to go ahead. Oh, could y'all let me um, screen share if you don't mind? Yes, I think I'm going to do co-host, but let me try one more time. Oh, no worries. Okay, how about now? Yes, now. Perfect, thank you. Um, okay, sorry, I'm working with like a dual monitor situation. Y'all don't, y'all just see this slide that's like balanced with that, right? Yep, looks great. Cool, perfect. Sorry, I just wanted to double check because like two monitors gets confusing sometimes. Um, but yeah, so thank you all so much for having me. Um, so today I'm going to kind of chat with you all about um, sort of the legacies essentially of what ACT UP did for us as a community and um, the ways they influence pop culture, the arts, healthcare, and so many other things. Um, I did want to preface this with um, a quick note um, that a 30 minute session is not going to be able to cover, like, I mean, it's scratching the surface. It is scratching the surface um, of what ACT UP does and, and has done um, historically and the legacies that they have, um, they have left us. Um, so I did just want to kind of acknowledge that. Um, probably silence equals death is something that many folks that are watching this or um, uh, attending this, um, this uh, virtual showcase have probably seen and or heard before. Um, but this is probably one of the sort of most famous um, sort of pieces of imagery um, that was utilized by ACT UP. Um, and certainly you still see it around today. Um, so in terms of kind of what we'll do in this session, so I will share some insights with you all um, and give kind of a quick overview of ACT UP. So just in case, um, just in case uh, folks aren't as aware of this organization, um, I'll give you kind of a quick overview so you know what we're talking about essentially. And then we'll talk essentially about their impact on media, the arts, um, and then healthcare, of course. Um, and pop culture is kind of infused in the media and art section of that. And I will save some time at the end um, for questions. Um, so if folks have questions, I'll try to save at least the five minutes at the end. But in terms of kind of a quick overview of ACT UP, um, I mean, this is a huge organization. This is a huge organization of community activists uh, from all around the world. Um, so it was actually founded in New York, but then Chapters, like I said, sprung up all over the place, um, literally all over the world um, for folks who were advocating for essentially um, more action, more action from their governments, more action from international organizations, more action from scientists, from universities, from pharmaceutical companies, from hospitals, um, and so many different other spaces. So when we're talking about ACT UP, there's kind of like three things that I was like, these are probably some things that are helpful for folks who aren't as familiar. Um, so as a, a sort of coalition, um, so ACT UP stands for the AIDS Coalition to Unleash Power. Um, and as a, a coalition, um, really the three things that I wanted to kind of focus on and share with you all, um, if this organization is new to you, um, is that they really have a direct focus on direct actions. Um, so this particular photograph right here, that you'll see under the direct action header, is an example of that. Um, so this is um, a really famous tactic that ACT UP used called the die-in. Um, and so essentially going to a, going to a place. Um, this particular photo is from the, um, actually at the FDA headquarters. Um, and so the idea of a die-in essentially is to go and to symbolically die. Um, and in this particular image, you see they obviously have tombstones um, with various, um, various slogans and um, statements on them. And so the idea behind this essentially is to um, really make sure that that action is direct, that you're taking that message directly to um, the organization that you're trying to impact change with. In this particular instance, it was the FDA. Um, and that's like the FDA headquarters, like um, someone climbed on top of that and put a silent school death banner on uh, a bunch of posters there as well. 
Um, but ACT UP also had a number of different specializations. So there were actually portions of ACT UP that worked with getting medicine to people in the community. There were portions of ACT UP that worked with helping take care of people um, whose um, HIV had progressed to AIDS and who were dealing with like severely compromised immune systems and essentially dying. Um, and there were also folks that worked on issues of housing, so making sure that people had stable and secure housing. Um, but there were also folks that did work around essentially the science of HIV um, and really working to essentially teach themselves the science and to better understand how they could consolidate this information and share it more publicly in the form of like research agendas, for instance, and then actively taking this to various AIDS and HIV conferences around the world. Um, and if you've seen the film, How to Survive a Plague, there's a pretty famous moment of a couple different conferences they went to, but there's actually one person who shares that she was really swayed by reading the research agenda and seeing like, oh, this is what we should be doing. Like, these are really great ideas. Um, and so there are various different um, sort of specialties um, that existed um, within ACT UP. Um, but then all of this work was also done with the importance of intentionality in mind. Um, everything down from like the imagery, the actions to who they were taking this message to and what they were saying and how they were doing it. Um, and this is another really famous, um, famous image from um, the early days of ACT UP. Um, and if you don't know who this person is, um, it is President Ronald Reagan, who took, I believe it was like four years before he actually publicly um, made any remarks about the HIV AIDS epidemic. Uh, but who also had a White House press secretary who actively made fun of the HIV AIDS epidemic any time reporters would ask about it. Um, and that was like literally in the White House briefing room on a regular basis. Um, so again, intentionality um, of how they are messaging is also another really critical, critical thing for ACT UP. So in terms of kind of the impact on the media, so ACT UP used the media in a really, really intentional way. And this really has helped us to better understand um, to better understand sort of how their organization worked and how they were successful. Um, and so one thing that they did as a part of their sort of various other aspects of their organization was they actually um, regularly issued media advisories about upcoming direct action. So again, it's maybe a little hard to sometimes conceptualize today, but um, we weren't all walking around with like, uh, folks aren't walking around with like baby computers in their hands, sort of able to connect to various parts of the world really, really easily like you can today. And so the use of sort of these media advisories was really important because it let the media know where they needed to be to get the footage that they wanted um, and to sort of see what was happening. Um, but as you can see, um, in addition to that, these media advisories are also really helpful um, because they also very clearly um, send sort of key messaging points to members of the media as well. So in addition, like this one, for instance, is a um, from a march on St. Pat Patrick's Cathedral in New York. Um, and so, you know, it's got obviously like the very clear things of like, you know, here's when, here's, here's um, the location, here's the date, here's all this stuff. But it's also, you know, letting folks know like, hey, here's why we're doing this. And here are these three points, and we are marching for this very specific thing. Um, and then also providing contact information. So inviting the media to also talk to them in an intentional way as well. And so when we're talking about um, sort of the use of the media, like this is a really critically important thing for ACT UP because it's also making sure that the broader public is seeing these direct actions, that they're talking about it, that this is making it on, um, making it on the news um, at a time when like, that was how folks got their news, like was watching television and sort of seeing what was happening. Um, and so really critically important work um, that um, definitely had a huge impact and has also allowed us um, to have so much archival footage of ACT UP. Um, but other segments of the organization, like when we're talking about media, other segments of the organization also did a really great job of internally capturing um, a lot of that footage for us. So if you've watched like, um, some of the various documentaries about ACT UP, um, you'll probably notice that there's a lot of different footage. And sometimes you'll see like the same footage in like multiple films, but oftentimes it's kind of unique because there's just so much of it. And part of that is because ACT UP did a really intentional job of not only inviting outside members of the media um, to their direct actions, 
but they did a really intentional job of capturing what was happening even within their own organization. Uh, sometimes for better or worse, meaning like we have arguments about like how to do things like also captured on the media or in internal um, documentation, um, but still. Um, and other segments also, um, other segments of the organization such as um, Diva TV. Um, and Diva TV was essentially kind of like an art slash education project of ACT UP uh, or associated with ACT UP. Um, but they actually also captured live footage of the event. Um, and their footage is really, really helpful um, in terms of making sure that we sort of have these live um, images of what's happening um, decades later. And so an example from this like protest at St. Paul's Cathedral, um, one of the reasons that we have really good media footage of what went on, the actual die-in in the cathedral itself, of which people were arrested for, people were dragged out of, out of the cathedral, um, the, the um, priest had them dragged away. Um, the reason we have some of that footage is because ACT UP was intentionally filming it. They wanted it to be captured. They invited members of the media to capture what was happening outside, and they were also capturing what happened outside, but they were also inside capturing this on camera as well. So making sure that we had this all documented. Um, and it's one reason that we have such a rich history of ACT UP um, to this day as well. In terms of kind of impact on the art, um, and Diva TV, I should mention, Diva TV was also kind of like, it was like very tongue in cheek. Um, so like you could kind of classify that as like art slash pop culture as well, um, just the way a lot of the things were filmed. So in addition to like capturing that footage, there was a lot of um, sorts of um, ad living, I guess you might say, um, going on with some of it in terms of, you know, talking about like what was happening in a particular moment or why it was so problematic. Um, and then there were obviously some other sort of um, elements of how that information gets out um, to the broader public too. But in terms of ACT UP's impact on the art, uh, they also definitely had a direct impact on the arts and pop culture. And this definitely also helped to produce a lot of um, symbols and images that are most certainly still associated with the movement today. So for instance, the um, Silent People's Death Banner, um, that is something that is really still prominent, prominently recognized today. Um, but you know, acclaimed artists uh, like Keith Haring, for instance, also produced work that highlighted the importance of the organization and its messaging. Um, so this is like, if you haven't, if you aren't familiar with Keith Haring, you've probably seen Keith Haring's work. He's kind of um, interesting figures. Um, and this is just one example of his work. Um, sometimes there's like a dog, sometimes there's like an angel and different images, but these are sort of, this is sort of aesthetic. Um, so this is an image that um, Herring produced at the end of um, the 1980s and essentially, you know, really directly putting ACT UP messaging on there, like fight AIDS, ACT UP, silence equals death, um, ignorance equals fear, and using his platform as an artist to also showcase that messaging, so bringing it into galleries. Um, and certainly Keith Haring's work, um, Keith Haring ultimately did die um, of, of complications related to AIDS. Um, but Keith Haring's work um, is also something that is very much entered like the pop culture um, sort of atmosphere. Um, you see it on t-shirts uh, all the time today. Um, it's really, really easy to interact with his work in a very public um, public way that doesn't involve being in part um, but this work also influenced other groups to also speak about the need for better HIV um, prevention efforts and HIV AIDS treatment options. And so another example um, that comes from actually that same year that Keith Haring produced this particular piece um, is um, a program called um, Day Without Art. And so a day without art essentially is a day where in its inaugural year it was actually colleges and museums um, and different educational institutions um, essentially recognizing the impact that the HIV AIDS epidemic was having on the art community. And so the idea behind a day without art is that we close our museums, that we don't allow folks to engage with the art within those spaces, that we don't host performances um, of like performative art, um, and essentially taking note of all of that stuff being inaccessible for a day and taking note of the impact that that has and recognizing that we've lost, and, and in that point, we're continuing to seriously lose a number of really prominent artists 
the HIV AIDS epidemic and the government inaction that's happening, particularly during the Ronald Reagan, uh, Ronald Reagan years in the, in the 1980s. And um, A Day Without Art is actually still something that happens every year. Um, it's an international event. Um, so if you are in Columbus and you're watching this, um, the Columbus Museum usually works with like Equifax Health and AIDS Healthcare Foundation, um, both based in Columbus, to do a program for A Day Without Art every year. Um, and in addition to that, um, some of the original partners are still doing that. Um, I was actually doing some archival stuff. Um, I was actually doing some archival stuff um, related to A Day Without Art, um, like maybe a year and a half ago. And I actually found out Kenyon College, where I work, was one of the inaugural um, sponsors of that program. And so we are actually working to like continue our participation now. Um, we were one of the first, um, first uh, organizations to work with it uh, and to host that first program um, in 1989. And have not sent. And so I'm making it my mission that we annually do that and engage that program every year, um, which is a really important piece of history. Um, and then in terms of ACT UP's impact on healthcare, so ACT UP also had a really critical impact on healthcare settings, um, of course, and this ultimately led to um, a number of safer and more effective medications and also led to making them more accessible as well. And so when we're talking about the early days of the HIV AIDS epidemic, um, in the very, very early days, there were no medications. Um, it was kind of like, well, let's just try this and we'll see how this works. Um, and you know, ultimately, um, the first medication that got authorized by the FDA here in the US was AZT. Um, and I know that someone actually just spoke, I think it was Jose had shared some stuff about AZT um, just a few moments ago in the Q&A for the previous presenter. Um, but AZT was something that, um, you know, ultimately is really tough. Like ACT UP produced these, these buttons, like I survived AZT, I survived DDT, because those early drugs were really, really, really hard on a lot of people's bodies. Um, and part of this was just the pharmaceutical industry wasn't investing um, in like actively, you know, researching these new drugs as, quick, as quickly as ACT UP was trying to pull trying to pressure them into doing. Um, but we also had um, the FDA that was being really, really, really slow on the authorization process, which of course you can definitely see some parallels between the COVID-19 pandemic and the HIV AIDS epidemic. Um, you know, AZT took years, years to get approval and the FDA really dragged their feet um, for a long time on approval on other drugs that were accessible in Europe and Japan and um, other areas of the world. Um, and, you know, now we're in this global pandemic and we've seen how an emergency use, use authorization for three vaccines here in the U.S. Um, has led to like over 150 million shots being administered across the country um, in record speed. And so, you know, we've definitely seen ways in which ACT UP's legacy here has directly impacted how quickly the government can move um, and can intentionally move. Um, particularly when we're dealing with a serious public health crisis, um, whether it is HIV or whether it is COVID-19. Um, but ultimately, um, a lot of the impact that ACT UP had on healthcare was going to conferences, making sure that their research agenda was being publicized, that it was helping to influence things, um, pressuring the FDA and the CDC um, essentially to give a damn, um, especially in the early days, and um, ultimately to you know make sure that they were um, trying to work with drug companies to, to, to get medications out quicker because people were actively dying. I mean, this is a time when we didn't, didn't have um, nearly the number of medications that we have today, but certainly those medications were not as safe and not as effective in terms of slowing the progression of HIV. Um, and now we've gotten to a place, obviously, um, with, with the science that um, antiretroviral therapy medications um, can can suppress people's viral load, get them to an undetectable status, which means they are untransmittable um, in terms of being able to pass HIV um, to a partner. Um, and so there's been a lot of serious impact uh, that ACT UP had here and serious improvements that are a direct result of, of their efforts. Um, and, you know, they really highlighted the importance of this research and access to care, but they also did those direct actions against pharmaceutical companies as well. Um, so recognizing that pharmaceutical companies, um, you know, held a lot of power 
in terms of deciding how they were going to prioritize certain drugs, um, what certain drugs they were going to invest in and try to research, what drugs they would eventually try to bring to the FDA for approval and when. And so this was not an uncommon thing for ACT UP to directly, um, directly challenge these drug manufacturers as well. Um, I mean, even to the point of like, with these buttons about I survived AZT and I survived DDT, literally putting the, um, putting the actual image of the pill with the company logo on them. So actually taking like an image of that and superimposing it on the button itself. But um, certainly some of their other protest materials um, also directly took aim at drug companies as well. And so this is one um, obviously dealing with AZT. I'm not sure if this looks familiar to anyone, but it is um, done in the design of an Enjoy Coke. Um, uh, flyer from the 19, like early 1990s, um, so like the old design for like Coca Cola. Um, I don't know if it's like if I just got it because like I'm from Georgia and like everything, everyone's about Coca Cola down there. Um, but uh, what you can see kind of with this particular image, um, in terms of like down here at the bottom, is you know, talking about the problem that AZT has for a lot of people. Um, so you know, directly mentioning that. The result, one drug, ABT, um, it makes half of the people who try it sick, and the other half, it stops working after a year. Is ABT the last best hope for people with AIDS, or is it a shortcut, or is it a shortcut to the killing Burroughs Wilcom is making in the AIDS marketplace? Um, and Burroughs Wilcom was the drug company that manufactured ABT. And so their ultimate question was, is this healthcare or wellcare? Um, so recognizing that this particular drug company was making a ton of money because even though AZT had a number of problems with like some people being able to take it, effectiveness in the long run, um, and a variety of other things, um, it was ultimately, um, you know, heavily, heavily uh, sort of marketed by the drug company that made it and they were making a lot of money. Um, AZT in the first year that it came out, it was about $10,000 a year, 10000 a year. And that was in 19, like, 1980 ish dollars. Uh, so $10,000 a year in terms of money in the 1980s is a lot more today. I'm not great with conversions. I think it's like close to $25,000 um, right now, um, but it certainly is more than $10,000, uh, which is still an absurd price in terms of like just a daily medication. Um, and a lot of health insurance companies um, didn't actually have to cover at that time, didn't have to cover HIV um, AIDS drugs as well. And so your health insurance, even if you had it, um, might not actually make that accessible for you. Um, and there were also plenty of issues in the early days of the HIV AIDS epidemic um, prior to um, HIV AIDS being included in the Americans with Disabilities Act, which wasn't even a reality when we're talking about AZT, like the early days of AZT. Um, that didn't get passed until 1990. Um, but there were also health insurance companies that were known for dropping people off of their coverage just for getting an HIV test just for getting a test. Um, and you can certainly see some of that, uh, some of that in terms of pop culture, some of that history. You can actually see it really well in season two of Pose. So if you were watching Pose on FX, um, you can see a moment where um, they run a HIV screen. Um, it actually might've been in the first season for this particular one, but they run an HIV screen on someone and the doctor doesn't report the patient doesn't report the patient. He kind of sneaks it into another thing. So it gets processed, but isn't it's not associated with anyone. And that's the reason. Because the health insurance company might drop you in coverage. They might say, well, oh, you're too risky. You're doing something risky. If you're at risk for HIV, um, we might not want to cover that. Um, and so there's a lot of impacts that ACT UP had on healthcare. And probably one of the most direct that you can see from it now is the fact that we have medications that can lead to folks being used and used. So again, undetectable and, and untransmittable. Um, but another really, really wonderful impact that you can certainly see is the fact that um, we also have other HIV prevention tools like PrEP and PEP, for instance. Um, and you know, certainly that is not without challenges. Um, AIDS activists um, have been working to pressure Gilead, the manufacturer for Truvada, um, for years to try to get them to release the patent that they had on Truvada, the medication um, that their company owned. And the idea there was that kind of similar to this, 
They're making a killing. They're making a lot of money. Um, and the idea is if you break the patent and you let other companies use your formulations and manufacture that drug, there's more options on the market and that will help make it cheaper. And so it is more accessible to people. Um, and, you know, Gilead responded in a couple of different ways, um, you know, with a few patient um, cost reduction programs that can, that can help folks without health insurance get um, prepped for as low as zero dollars a month and like coupon copay cards for folks with health insurance to help reduce the cost to as low as zero dollars a month. Um, and ultimately they did break the patent, um, albeit very recently. Um, I think it was literally like within, it's been within the pandemic, like it's been within the pandemic. Um, and so it's been a very, very recent thing, um, but that patent is officially now broken. Um, and there are other manufacturers of PrEP as well now. So a lot of huge impact. Um, that being said, I want to like feed the rest of my time for questions. I promise you all that you have that. And I'm sorry, I, there's so much history here. Like, I really struggled with this to try to figure out like what to highlight. Um, and I just wanted to make sure that I've done this justice as much as possible because we owe a lot to the folks um, that, that were part of ACT UP and that have done this work for us um, and our community has been like a whole heck of a lot. Liz, you've been doing a great job. Just a warning, we do definitely have time for questions, but there's about five minutes left. Stop sharing. A question I have is how do we continue to protest and um, you know do direct action in the spirit of ACT UP today? Yeah. <clears throat> so I think one thing is like the fact that we've seen like folks that have been, you know, protesting Gilead and like calling them out for not releasing the patent. Um, and, you know, that eventually worked and they did break the patent. Um, but in terms of like other ways that we can do these kind of direct actions, like if we're a college student, for instance, um, you know, I'll give you an example of opinion students did. Um, like my position, like I, my position didn't exist like three years ago at Kenyon. Um, and when I was interviewing, students were like, we need prep on campus, make it happen. Like, we don't care who comes into this job, but we need that person to make this happen. Um, and like, they were doing that direct action of like communicating like, hey, this is what we need. Like, let's work to make it happen. Um, you know, and then ultimately, like that was like priority one for me. I was like, all right, let's, let's, before I, because I was hired over the, over the summer, I was like, before any these students even get back, I want to make sure we have a way for them to access PrEP and a plan for them to access it um, for as low as zero dollars a month to make sure that it is truly accessible. Um, and we did it, you know, but uh, that was a result of those students really communicating what they needed to happen. Um, and so I would say that's one example. Um, there's obviously a lot of stuff going on with like reproductive health and reproductive freedom, like anti-reproductive health and reproductive freedom legislation. Um, I am a firm believer that like, when we're talking about like reproductive justice, like we're talking about like HIV AIDS, um, treatment and prevention options, but we're also talking about other access, access to reproductive care, such as abor abortions. And so, you know, really making sure to stand in solidarity um, with the folks that are doing that work, particularly here in Ohio, um, where we're seeing a lot of that activism happening right now. Um, so I would say continuing to support that um, and really, you know, whatever space you're in, making sure to continue, um, you know, speaking about the importance of having these resources available in an accessible um, and, you know, culturally humble way. And I can give you one more example, like our students like also were like, we, we did safer, well, we had safer sex supplies like available, you know, when I started, but we were giving out condoms, which like lots of colleges do, like not super unnormal, but okay, like, Condoms are great. Condoms are, are a really useful tool, um, but also so is, a high, so is a high quality lubricant to make sure that condom does not break. And so making sure that you're also making those options available to folks too, um, so they have, you know, sort of the fullest range of tools to support their sexual health. Um, so like if there's other folks that are like managing spaces that provide free condoms, like making sure to provide free lubricants as well, it's also super important. I love hearing about these student initiatives. I'm always so impressed and so, I don't know, invigorated whenever I hear about 
know, folks my age that are that are doing the hard work and, and making actual differences in our community. Is uh, it time for maybe one more quick question or one wrapping up comment? I'll do a lightning, a lightning answer. I guess the question will be, what is your contact information? And can you drop it in the chat, please? Oh yeah, I'll drop it in the chat. Yeah. Um, yeah, whatever I can do. If anyone has any questions or things that I can do to help out, just feel free to let me know. Thank you so much. What a wonderful presentation. I love learning more about ACT UP and all the great things that they have done and you know continue to do. Thank you all so much for hosting this wonderful event. And I will go off onto mute so the next speaker can hop in. Thank you all. <laughs>